Good evening. This is John Bailey standing in front of Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. This is indeed a red-letter night in the history of Ford Theater, April 14, 1865. Because tonight, President Abraham Lincoln and his party will attend a special charity performance of the celebrated English comedy, Our American Cousin. Inside the theater, the curtain has already gone up. Outside, here in front of the theater, the crowd of curious spectators Fine. stand around. April 14, 1865. Paris. Place, Washington, D.C. You are there. Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. CBS takes you back to one of the great dramas in our nation's history. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. You are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, Washington, April 14th, 1865, and John Daly. The damp and misty weather in Washington tonight has not dampened the ardor of the crowd, who for four long days now have been wildly celebrating the surrender of General Lee to General Grant. The people here are in high spirits, gathered around Ford Theater, which is a three-story redstone building, windows and entrances in gray. Tultable Saloon is on the right, Ferguson Saloon is on the left, and both of them are jammed. The windows and doors of the houses along both sides of the street are open. People are hanging out of them for a look at the president. Although the curtain has gone up on the play, some members of the cast, who are not on stage at the moment, stand around in their costumes for a look at Mr. Lincoln. There's John Dyess and Mrs. Helen Muzzy. There's young Miss Jane Gowdy and John Wilkes Booth, the handsome, dashing Shakespearean favorite. He is not in the performance tonight, by the way. I think I see over there... Oh, yes, there's Mr. Harry Ford, one of the three brothers who manage this theater. Now, if I can just get through to him, excuse oh, me, I please. Oh, well, let me push there. through here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but watch the cable. Oh, Mr. Ford! Mr. Ford! Yes, sir? Say, Mr. Ford, this is CBS. You have a great crowd here tonight. Yes, the theater is sold out. And have you raised your prices for tonight? Tonight is a charity benefit. The orchestra is one dollar, the dress circle and the parquet, 75 cents, and the family circle is 25 cents. I see. Well, this is the second time President Lincoln has attended your theater, isn't it, Mr. Ford? Yes, and tonight he's going to sit in the same box. And I brought in that old rocker he liked. Oh, thanks very much, Mr. Ford. Not at all, any Thanks a lot. I think I see John F. Parker, the president's personal guard, arriving on foot. Evidently, he's come ahead of the president to be on hand when Mr. Lincoln and his party arrive. Now, if I can get through to him, excuse me, please. Let me... I'm sorry, but watch the cable. Mr. Parker! Oh, Mr. Parker! Say, Mr. Parker, this is CBS. Has the president's carriage left the White House? Is he on his way over here? Yes, he and Mrs. Lincoln left about ten minutes ago to pick up Major Rathbone and Miss Harris. Well, aren't General Grant and Mrs. Grant in the party? No, they were supposed to come, but General Grant left on the evening train for Burlington. Oh, that's too bad. We kind of hoped we'd see the general as well as Mr. Lincoln. Say, by the way, who is Miss Harris? Well, that's Miss Clara Harris, daughter of the senator from the state of Maine. Oh, yes, of course. And Major Rathbone is an attaché at the water department. That's right. Hey, excuse me, Clara. Yes, the president's carriage is just coming down 10th Street now. It has crossed F Street. It's going to pull up right here at the carriage platform. The president is smiling, bowing, doffing his high black silk hat to the crowd. And the band that's been waiting here for this moment is picking up its instruments and getting ready to play. Burns, the coachman, is throwing up the horses now. The carriage is stopping at the platform. Forbes, the footman, has jumped down to assist the party as they get out. Mrs. Lincoln and Miss Harris are getting out, and now the president, followed by Major Rasko. The band wants to play a tune. They're asking the president what it is he wants to hear, but it will probably be Yankee Doodle marching through Georgia or rally around the flag. The president just said something to the band leader, but in all of this racket, I just can't hear what he's saying. Oh, do you hear that? It's sexy. Mr. Lincoln has asked the Union Band to play the Confederate song and they've responded with a will. understands the meaning of Mr. Lincoln's request. It's his policy of forgiveness and reconciliation with the South. 
of harmony for the nation. The war is over. The United States of America is now one great nation. And Mr. Ford is leading the way into the theater, up the great stone steps. Mr. Lincoln's just a few feet away. Oh, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, this is CBS, sir. May I ask you a question? Fire away. Well, as you know, Mr. President, the newspapers and a part of the clergy have been uh, opposed to your practice of attending the theater. And I'm sure that... Yes, I know. Some think I do wrong to go to the opera and the theater, but it rests me. I love to be alone and get to be with the people. I want to get this burden off to change the current of my thoughts. A hearty laugh relaxes me, and I seem better able after it to bear my cross. I understand, sir. Good night. Good night, Mr. Lincoln, and thank you. <laughs> now the presidential party has entered the door. A CBS microphone is inside the theater at the rear of the orchestra. President Lincoln will pass it in just a minute, and so into the theater and Don Hollander. The audience doesn't yet know the president has arrived. The ladies might be interested, by the way, to know that Mrs. Lincoln is wearing a white silk crinoline under her cloak. I'm trying to see here. It's an, an elaborate headdress of flowers and combs over her curls. There's silken mittens and a shawl held together at her throat with a brooch. The president, well, he seems to have lost a lot of weight, but, oh, he looks happy tonight, very happy. And now the party is turning right and going upstairs to the boxes. The president should be there in just a minute. The audience has caught sight of the president. The play stops. The orchestra strikes up Hail to the Chief. And now CBS has a booth directly across the theater from the president's box. And I see that John Daly's reached it. So over to John Daly. We're in the CBS box now. I can see the president entering his box across the theater. We have Columbia microphones on the stage and in the audience. I'm going to open them both and let you hear what's going on. Now, the audience is standing. Mr. Lincoln is acknowledging the welcome. Beaming, he nods his head and waves to the jam-packed crowd. And now, motioning towards the stage and the interrupted play, Mr. Lincoln sits down. The ovation continues, but following the president's lead, slowly, almost by sections, the audience resumes its seats and the play will resume in just a moment. Uh, Our American Cousin by Tom Taylor, by the way, is an eccentric comedy, as many of you probably know. It's a popular favorite, been performed at least a thousand times. The play revolves around a typical, drawling Yankee in England who lights his cigar with an old will, burning the document to ashes and thereby throwing a fortune into the hands of an English cousin. And now, the CBS microphones on the stage will pick up some of the dialogue. Lord Dundreary, a silly, foppish Englishman, is being teased by Florence the heroine, played by the star Miss Laura Keene. Yes, what a lonely one. What sort of night had she? Oh, a very refreshing one. Thanks to the draft I've described for her. <laughs> what? Have you been prescribing for Georgina, Lord Dundreary? Oh, yes, yes, quite. You see, I gave her a draft that cured the effect of the draft. <laughs> and that draft was a draft that didn't pay the doctor's bill. <laughs> What a number of drops. You almost have a game of drops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? That was a joke, that was. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone can see the drop has been suspended. <laughs> Miss Keene has very neatly injected a bit of the national peace celebration into the play. With Lord Dunbury making so much of the word draft, Miss Keene threw in the line, anyone can see the draft has been suspended. And everyone in the audience knows that General Grant suspended the military draft this very morning. That was quite keen of Miss Keene, if I may be permitted the fun. Well, the president enjoyed that joke, too. He's smiling broadly. The play continues, and we'll take you again to the stage presently, but on this gala night, the audience is as interested in the presidential party as they are in the play, although because of the angle at which the box is set, they can only see Miss Harris and Major Rathbone. The presidential party is occupying boxes number seven and eight, the partition between them having been removed to make it roomier. 
The boxes are decorated with four flags. The president is seated in that old rocker that Mr. Ford told us about before. There's a chair at the door of the box in which John Parker, the god, is sitting. He can't see the stage, but he can hear the actor's voices. Oh, evidently John Parker wants to see and hear, for he's now getting up from his chair and taking a seat in the dress circle with a clear view of the stage. Mrs. Lincoln is seated on the president's right, and from time to time she leans over on his arm and they exchange a few words. The president appears completely relaxed, and perhaps his mind is on other things. Perhaps he is looking at his wife and thinking, we've had a hard time since we came to Washington, but the war is over, and with God's blessing, we may hope for four years of peace and happiness, and then we'll go back to Illinois and pass the rest of our lives in quiet. But then it's more likely that Mr. Lincoln is just plain enjoying himself tonight, for the president is listening with obvious pleasure to Mrs. Mount Chessington, an English lady in the cast, and Harry Hawk, who is playing Asa Trenchard, the American cousin. Now, once again, our microphones on the stage pick up the play. Well, Mr. Trenchard, you are not used to the manners of good society, and that alone will excuse the impertinence of which you have been guilty. <laughs> Mrs. Mount Chessington flounces off an aristocratic dungeon, leaving a drawling Yankee alone on the stage. Don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal. You sock dollogizing old man crap. What was that? It sounded like a shot, but there's no shot in the play. One moment. Oh, Major Rathbone is, is struggling with a man in Mr. Lincoln's box. A man who is stabbing wildly at him with a knife. Major Rathbone's giving ground before that knife, and now his attacker has no, leapt no, over the railing. He's on no, the stage. No, no, no. The man has risen. He's running across the stage. He's gone through the stage exit directly under this box. That was Major Rathbone who shouted out, Stop that man. Someone in the audience has leapt over the footlights after him. Something has happened. Something is terribly wrong. This is not part of the play. Blue smoke is curling from President Lincoln's box. I can't see him because... Miss Harris and the Major and Mrs. Lincoln are surrounding him. Mr. Lincoln! President Lincoln has been shot! That was Mrs. Lincoln who just cried out, he has shot Mr. Lincoln! The man did it! The man who ran across the stage! The man who grappled with the Major! John Hollenbeck is out there in the theater, already fighting his way up to the President's box, so go ahead, Hollenbeck! John Hollenbeck, I guess we're on the air here. I'm trying to get through this crowd to find out what's going on. I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's happened. What is it? What's happened? Tell me what's happened. Someone has shot Mr. Lincoln. It was Booth. Who? One member of the crowd has identified Mr. Lincoln's attacker. He says it was Booth, the actor. John Wilkes Booth. We'll try to get someone who was in or near Mr. Lincoln's box. Let me through, please. Let me through. Watch the cable, please. Watch it just a minute. Thank you very much. The whole theater is in an uproar. Everyone's standing, running up and down the aisle. Women are moaning and fainting. Miss Keene is handing water up to Mr. Lincoln's box. Watch that cable, please. Men are lifting up an army sergeant and army surgeon up on their shoulders. The stage is swarming with people. We'll get through to Mr. Lincoln's box now in just a second. Stay back! Back! Soldiers blocking Everyone the door. The bayonet's poised. That soldier's back. crying. Tears are streaming from his eyes. Back. There's an officer. Back. Lieutenant! Back. Lieutenant! Back. Lieutenant Crawford, sir. Lieutenant Crawford, what happened? Well, I was sitting in the seat. There's the door to Mr. Lincoln's box. I saw Booth go in. Just walk in, but where were the, where were the guards? Well, I don't know. I, I heard a shot, and I saw Booth leap over the railing. His spur caught in the flag as he jumped. It ripped the flag and broke his fall and maybe broke his leg. Oh, are you sure it was Booth? I swear it. What did you do? Did you get into the president's box? Well, I rushed it, but the door was barred. Booth had bought it when he went in from the inside and we broke through. Major Rathbone let the doctors through. Only the doctors. Look, have they caught Booth? Just a minute, just a minute, Lieutenant. The door is opening. Four soldiers are carrying Mr. Lincoln out. Are you the president? Are you taking him? Are you taking him to the White House? No, no, not to the White House. Doctors, doctors, the room more than Mr. Lincoln lives. Guards! President Lincoln is being carried out of the theater now. I've just been informed that John Daly's out in the street again, so go ahead, Daly. Two more soldiers have joined the four who are carrying the president out here into 10th Street. The street is jammed with people who have heard the news. It's a wild, awe, panic-stricken, swirling mob. The guy.
guards are having a hard time breaking through the mob, crossing the street. The long roll you hear is the alert being sounded. There's a light in the house, and the door is open. A man stands at the door with a candle, calling to the group carrying Mr. Lincoln. They're taking the present in there. The number is 453, 453 10th Street. Anybody know who lives in that house? Peterson! It's the Peterson house! It's the only house available. The present White House guard is thundering into the street. Perhaps you can hear the ring of their horses' hoofs on the cobblestone. They're flashing their sabers and clearing the street. President Lincoln has been shot. President Lincoln has been shot. There's been so much excitement. Only now, the full horror of what has just happened at Ford Theater is beginning to dawn. We will stay here in front of the Peterson house and bring you immediately any reports on Mr. Lincoln's condition. But we have just been informed that something has happened elsewhere in Washington that we don't know of here on the scene, and so we return you now to our studio. And I'll give you the bulletins as fast as they come in, Quincy, as soon as we get it back from Daly down there on the street, right? Uh, how, how much time have I got, though? How long am wait, I wait, on? Wait a minute. Go ahead. You're on the air. Uh, this is Quincy Howe. John Daly has just announced that an attempt has been made on the life of Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Secretary of State Stewart, Seward, I should say, has also... Uh, just a second. Here's the bulletin. Uh, Secretary of State Seward has been attacked. A man entered the Seward House on Lafayette Square in Washington tonight. He overpowered all resistance, gained entrance to the secretary's bedroom, and slashed at Mr. Seward with a knife. It's not known whether the attacker was John Wilkes Booth or an accomplice, or whether the two attacks were connected. Now, here's Ned Calmer with more bulletins. All Washington is in a state of panic this terrible night of April 14th, 1865. There are wild rumors that the entire cabinet has been murdered, that General Grant has been assassinated, that the war is not yet over. There's no evidence as yet that these other wild rumors are true. I repeat, the other rumors are not true so far as is known. Secretary of War Stanton has arrived at the house on 10th Street where Mr. Lincoln has been taken. He's in complete charge of the situation up to now. Now again, Quincy Howe. John Wilkes Booth has escaped. He left Ford's theater by a rear door, leapt on a horse that was waiting for him, and dashed off into the darkness. Someone from the audience chased him, just missed him, a matter of inches. Booth left Washington by the Navy Yard Bridge, where a sentry challenged him and he gave his real name, John Wilkes Booth. The following is the fiend's description. Age, 26, life and sinewy of body, having probably a broken leg, intensive speech and behavior. Height, 5 feet 8, weight 160 pounds. Hair black, eyes black, heavy dark eyebrows, wears a large seal ring on little finger, when talking moves his head forward, looks down. That is John Wilkes Booth. Rewards totaling $100,000 have been offered for his capture. Armed pursuit groups are after him already. Booth must have had help. He just couldn't have committed this crime by himself or without lots of preparation. But who slashed Secretary Seward? Who crossed the Navy Yard Bridge a few moments after Booth? Why was it that Booth tried to see Vice President Johnson this afternoon and then left his calling card when he failed? Who cut the telegraph wires out of Washington and, and why? Where was the president's guard, John F. Parker? How could Booth have possibly gained entrance to the president's box without being challenged? These are some of the questions that the tragedy has raised here in this bewildered capital. How deep do the roots of this plot go? Does the trail perhaps lead right to persons highly placed up in the government? A note has just been handed me. John Daly in front of the Patterson House has news of President Lincoln's condition. So we take you now to the Peterson House. This is John Daly in front of the Peterson House, where President Lincoln was carried after he was shot in Ford's Theater across the street. The President is sinking swiftly. He has not regained consciousness since Booth sent a single bullet fired at close range into the area behind the President's ear. The surgeons are discussing now the question of removing that bullet. Mrs. Lincoln is in there at the bedside. So is the President's son, Captain Robert Lincoln. Tad, the President's younger son, is at the White House. He has been assured that his father will live, but this was told the lad only to quiet him. Major Rathbone was slashed about the arm and shoulder by Booth and fainted from a loss of blood. He has been taken home. In addition to Secretary of War Stanton, most of the cabinet members have arrived, and here comes the Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Gideon Wells. Mr. Wells, oh, Mr. Wells, uh, this is CBS. 
We know how great your grief is at this moment, sir, but there are so many questions still to be answered about this frightful tragedy. Will you help us? Who is this amazing madman, John Wilkes Booth? This lunatic, this unspeakable Judas, is a known secessionist who did not have the courage to don the uniform of his cause. But what possible motive, sir, do you think he could have had in committing this hideous crime? Only a mind deranged could have given birth to such an act. It may be that he thought to kindle again the dead spark of rebellion. If so, he is as great a fool as he is a villain. The war is over. The Union will stand. Booth has done the Confederate cause more harm than he can imagine. What about the South, sir? What will the South think of Booth's act? I do not know the mind of the South, but I predict that when the men who fought with Lee, in uniform, under a flag, and according to a clean code, here of this day, they will shrink with horror from this vile deed. Assassination is not an American tradition. It never struck in this country until tonight. Thank you, Mr. Wells. I know that as Mr. Lincoln's friend and secretary of the Navy, you want to go in and see him. A note has just been handed me. It says, oh, this is sad and tragic news. The president's pulse is still falling. His breathing becomes more labored. That's all the note says. As this night of unutterable gloom and sadness wears on, stern resolve melts. Great men weep openly. There's scarcely a dry eye in this crowd here. The door to the Peterson house is opening once again, and Mr. John Hay, President Lincoln's private secretary, is coming out. Mr. Hay, Mr. Hay, over this way, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Hay, you've been close to Mr. Lincoln. Did he have any fear that he might be struck down before his great work was finished? Our, our beloved president constantly received threatening letters which he filed away in an envelope. In, in March last month, there were 80 letters in the envelope. It was marked assassination. Well, you mean letters from cranks and, and that sort? Yes. In, uh, in 1860, in Springfield, Mr. Lincoln saw a double image of himself in a mirror. One face held the glow of life and breath. The other shone ghostly pale, white, portent of a safe passage through the first term and, and death before the end of the second. That was five years ago, then, that he had this omen? Yes, of what... but, but only last week the president dreamed that he was walking through the White House amid the sound of great sobbing. In the East Room, he came upon a coffin guarded by soldiers, surrounded by a weeping throng. The president asked, Who is dead in the White House? And the soldier replied, the president, he was killed by an assassin. Well, how did Mr. Lincoln feel about these presentiments? Perhaps he answered that question this afternoon. He, he was walking across the White House grounds and he passed some profane, drunken men. Mr. Lincoln remarked to his guard, Crook, do you know, I believe there are men who want to take my life. And I have no doubt they will do it. I, I know no one could do it and escape alive. But if it is to be done, it is impossible to prevent it. Thank you, Mr. Hay. The tragic news of the attack on President Lincoln has spread around the world. And now CBS takes you to important European capitals. First, to Buckingham Palace in London, England and the voice of Her Britannic Majesty, Queen Victoria. I speak to Mrs. Lincoln. No one can better appreciate than I, who am myself utterly broken-hearted by the loss of my own beloved husband, what your suffering must be. And I earnestly pray that you may be supported by him to whom alone the sorely stricken can look for comfort. And now to the French capital. Thousands of us in the Latin Quarter. President Lincoln is a 
is a citizen. There are no longer any countries shut up in narrow frontiers. Our country is everywhere where there are neither masters nor slaves, where people live in liberty or fight for it. From Paris, we take her now to the capital of Russia. This is St. Petersburg, Russia. I will read a message from Leo Tolstoy, our great Russian author, who has just been informed of the attempted assassination of President Lincoln. The message reads, In far places over the earth, on every continent, the name of Lincoln will be worshipped, and the personality of Lincoln will become a world folk legend. Many hardships and much experience brought him to the realization that the greatest human achievement is love. The greatness of Napoleon, Caesar, or Washington is moonlight by the sun of Lincoln. His example is universal and will last thousands of years. Lincoln is Humanity. We return you now to the United States. This is John Daly in front of the Peterson home on 10th Street. It is past 7 o'clock in the morning, April 15, 1865. President Lincoln was shot last night at 10 15. Doctors say there is no hope. The long vigil will soon be over. Here outside the Peterson house, a cold rain is falling. The sky is dully gray. The early morning mist is like a shroud. The hearts of men and women are overflowing with grief. Some are kneeling, some lifting their voices in the singing of spirituals. We are told that Mrs. Lincoln is not in the room with the president. She has made her last farewell and is seated in a back parlor. Captain Robert, the president's son, is leaning on Secretary Stanton's arm. He has borne himself well. Only twice has he given way to his overwhelming grief. The Reverend Dr. Gurley has spoken a prayer. For Abraham Lincoln, there will be black borders on the newspapers today. Anguished sermons on Resurrection Sunday tomorrow in a resting place. There will be the end of the mortal, but the beginning of the immortal. For Abraham Lincoln will live on in the union he has saved, in the freedom he has given, in the dreams he has dreamed, in the vision he has seen, the vision under God of a new birth of freedom, of government of the people, by the people, for the people. Secretary of War Stanton is coming out of the Peterson house now. He pauses in the doorway, and the crowd, looking at his grief-stricken face, is suddenly silent. Mr. Stanton, how is Mr. Lincoln? No. He belongs to the ages. The dread thing that we have awaited is come. President Lincoln is dead. The victim of Booth's business. Washington, April 14, 1865. Abraham Lincoln is assassinated at Ford's Theater. <laughs> <laughs> 